connecting. Oh. Awesome. Okay. Right. We are live. This is week four of OLS4 and welcome uh, everybody. So we will go through our usual housekeeping and then we will kick off with the main bits of the call. So everyone, please feel free to sign in in the Etherpad roundabout line 69 right now. Um, you can choose a color on the top right by clicking on the people icon. And we have an exciting icebreaker question where you can choose to share an image um, or some other piece of media about your feelings having joined and participated in OLS4 for a few weeks. Whew, sorry, I should have had a full stop in there somewhere. Um, so first things first, we have a code of conduct with OLS. Um, broadly, this means please treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive when someone else interacts with you. If at any point you feel like this has not happened, either that's something that you've experienced or something that you've witnessed, um, then we would like to try and fix that and try to do something about that. So you can report that to Emmy, Malvika, me or Berenice, we're the four co-founders of OLS. Um, so you can reach us on the team, team email at team at openlifesci.org. Um, or if you want to reach one of us individually rather than as a group, then just uh, use one of our individual emails. Those are on lines 100 and 101. Um, and we have a transcript for this call. Um, so basically um, an AI machine is listening in and automatically saying what we are uh, recording, typing down what we are saying as we speak. You can access that on the top left of your Zoom screen. For me, it says live on otter.ai, click here to open live transcript. Um, so that's when, when you've joined the call and it said streaming, we are not streaming to YouTube, we are streaming to Otter. Um, and this just means that you can maybe catch if you've missed out words um, or something like that. So um, what else do I need to say? Right, okay, Otter does not work in breakout rooms. We will have breakout rooms during this call. Um, and so to ensure that people can participate fully, we um, offer two ways of running breakout rooms. There's spoken breakout rooms and there's written breakout rooms. Um, so in order to allow us to sort you into the correct rooms uh, based on your preferences, what we ask is that you edit your Zoom names. Um, so to do that, for me on my Mac, and it may vary on your screen, I open the participants button in Zoom, and then I go over to my name, and I click on the more button, and I click rename. And so I then am going to put W in front of my name, which is um, indicates that I want to be in a written room. If you would prefer a spoken room, put S in front of your name. And that just allows us to sort you into the correct room based on your preferences. Um, so I can see a few of you have done it already, but I will pause for just a moment to give everyone the chance to do that. Um, OK, I think we're almost all there. Cool. Um, I think those are all the housekeeping housekeeping things for now. So um, the next thing is drum roll. Everyone, thank you who's suggested names for the OLS4 cohort. Um, we have a bunch of responses in the polls and I can see that things have been shuffling very last minute, but still the forerunner is still the forerunner. So right now we have two names and I'm not sure how we choose which one is which. <laughs> Um, but it looks like the winning option in the poll, I'm just going to refresh and make sure it's correct, is Kanaz or Kaunin, uh, which is the rune of openness and creativity. Um, so we are going for a non-English name, which is beautiful and delightful. How do we choose which of those two we go for, folks? Um, <laughs> this is the question. Um, I am trying to think anyone have any really sudden quick weird voting zoom schemes to think of to suggest here emojis use emojis reactions like, uh, reactions yeah maybe okay. like a thumbs up for the first one and a heart for the second one or something like that all right okay let's see if we can do this if you would like kenaz i hope i'm not mispronouncing this please do a thumbs up. If you would like Kaunin, go for a heart. If you are here, you are eligible to vote. Please, um, so use the reactions button on the bottom of your screen. And hmm, um, I'm getting some Kanaz kind of feelings here, folks. <laughs> oh, I've got some more hearts. Um, 
No, I, th I still think it's Kanaz. Yep. All right, folks, OLS4 is, is now the Kanaz cohort. If I'm mispronouncing this and you are the person who proposed it, please let me know so we can say it right. <laughs> Otherwise, we have a beautiful cohort name, uh, following the steps of Perseverance, Mast Cohort, and Open Seeds. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. This is exciting. <laughs> right. Um, next thing, uh, let me get my etherpad back, is anyone new this week who hasn't introduced themselves in one of the previous two calls? If you would like to spend just two minutes telling us who you are, where you are, and what your project is, and a hobby. Uh, please uh, feel free to add your name in uh, line 112 or um, just unmute and go for it. I'm new. Thank you, Yo, for uh, introducing me. Or Yeah, I'll introduce myself, myself actually. So I'm Arendt. Uh, I'm a PhD student working at uh, Delft University of Technology in, a, in the Netherlands. And my OLS project is about multi-beam electron microscopy for imaging of biological volumes. And a short term project here in, in this OLS, OLS course would be to conduct research and publish in an open science way. And a long-term goal to project would actually be to join, either join or create a community that works uh, together on developing methodology for a multi-beam electron microscopy and volume electron microscopy in, uh, in general. And my hobby is uh, playing funk guitar. Yeah. Excellent. Lizanna, do you want to have a go? I was just saying hi, actually. This is not the, the, the... Right it's hand. the wrong hand. <laughs> right, it was that hand, not that hand. My bad. <laughs> cool. Um, Alex. Yeah, um, maybe I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a mentor, but I haven't been on one of the B, um, cohort calls before. So maybe I should very quickly say hello to everyone. So my name is Alex. I'm a mentor, um, um, actually, of Elisa, who's also here. So hi, Elisa. And um, yeah, she um, has a project on on I would call it analyzing the landscape of data stewardship, and I'm very happy to, to work with her on this. And I'm here today um, to see, um, to be kept in the loop, to see how everything works and yeah, excited about it. Ah, and about a hobby, I love hiking. At the moment, I'm based in Cambridge and it's very flat around Cambridge. So <laughs> it's not so easy, but nevertheless, I, I, I still love it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, anyone else from the OLS4 cohort who hasn't had a chance to introduce themselves yet? I think mostly we have some fantastically familiar faces now, so I think we're good. Um, I will give a few more moments awkward silence. Feel free to also speak up in chat if that's easier. Cool. Um, Emmy, I've just realized I totally stole your bit. <laughs> oh, you were supposed to do the last part, weren't you, with the intros? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'll take over the next bit, which is supposed to be Berenice's. Um, but uh, but we get straight into it. And thank you, Yo, for running the wonderful introduction. Hi, everyone who didn't join us before. I will also do this rather slowly because it may be your first breakout room for some of you. Um, so we're going to be split into small groups using the magical powers of Zoom. Um, and Yo would be busy setting up the different rooms right now. But we'd like you to, uh, within your group of three people, around three people, um, share two things. So first is think of the time you were collaborating or working on an open project and it was a complete train wreck what had happened, what had made it so chaotic. And then think of a time you were collaborating or working on an open project and everything was perfect. So what happened there um, and what made it sublime? Um, so three people, uh, 10 minutes for a discussion, which means around three minutes per person in the group, try and keep the um, speaking slash writing time even. 
um, if you could and take some notes if you can so that we can all look at it afterwards and learn from each other's discussion. So again, in spoken rooms, um, you are just free to chat. And in the break written breakout rooms, you are free to write your notes either in the Zoom chat, which will not be visible to anyone outside of your Zoom room, or using the Etherpad. I think we have some sections which are um, of empty bullet points um, from 928 onwards. So you'd be able to use those, find your number, room number, add your names and add your notes. If you have any problems within your breakout rooms, press the ask for help button to <coughs> the bottom of your screen on the menu bar and one of us will come and help. Are we ready, Yo? Or is it? <laughs> With whole seconds to spare, I'm quite proud. <laughs> I'm proud okay. of you too. <laughs> um, okay, folks. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you're a mentor or a guest, you're welcome to join rooms, but you don't have to. It's up to you if you want to respond to the prompts or not. Thank you. OK, I guess we're ready to go. Opening as we speak. A uh, quick check, Alex, I didn't know if you wanted to be assigned to a room. No, but thank you for checking. Sorry, I'm lit I finished work like five minutes ago, so I'm still wrapping up. I will be around. No worries, no worries. Whenever it is. Yeah, but thanks for checking. Cool. See Lily's busy away as well. Welcome back. Welcome back from your breakout rooms. Um, seeing a lot of Nice notes. Um, does anyone did, did any did, did anyone find anything surprising and would like to share that with the rest of the cohort? Please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Not very scared to leave the awkward silence, but um, I'll let, let you keep thinking about it and just going through it here. Um, I see the train wreck scenarios, um, teams have put down. Yeah, purposes aren't shared or aren't clear. Um, there's no clear vision. Um, there's disagreements with different people, uh, shortage of resources, that's very real. Um, uh, probably not the right, not the necessary, did not have the necessary training. I, I see Alejandro's um, story here. And um, I'm just looking at the stuff that is coming up slowly, typing in. Um, and on the perfect projects, <laughs> Ariel says, I don't think I've ever worked on a perfect project. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, but many of us have worked on successful projects, which is great to see um, with clear aims where people had clear roles. Um, uh, Lasana says uh, perfect project was where she worked with locals um, and changes both from top down to bottom up. Um, and let me see. Yeah, if, if there are better um, divisions of uh, work and where cases where there are more clear contributing um, guidelines and governance. Um, this is where we've also seen um, projects that work better. <laughs> I'm reading reading Ariel's comment from the from the chat as well. Yep, definitely. That's the mindset, the growth mindset <laughs> that we can always do something better next time. Um, does anyone have something they'd like to highlight to the rest of the group? Um, sorry, just occurred to you as well. Or a question. Well, keep thinking about it. 
And I will for now pass over to Emma. Hi, so um, we have had a question, maybe Aaron, I think we need to move on. So um, do you want to put your question in the, in the chat and we'll have a, we can have a conversation while we're in the next bit. So um, um, today we're going to introduce um, about project structures and how we can make those successful projects. Um, so it's really about planning and structuring them in a, in a good way. So thinking about four standard files that we can put into our repositories. So one being a license, another a readme file, and then contributing um, guidelines and a code of conduct. So we're going to go through each of these. We've got some different speakers. Um, to give you an idea, um, to introduce each of them, what they are, and some examples. So first of all, it's over to Caitlin. Thank you very much for being a speaker today. Thanks, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen. Oh, if I can share my screen. Just to put the slides up. I've just enabled it. Okay. Try again. Perfect. Okay. Let's see. Bear with me one moment here. Um, Okay, give it one second there. Do you all see the title screen there? Perfect. Um, well, huge thanks again to the organizers for inviting me to come join. Um, talking about licenses is one of my favorite things to do. And it's something I don't get a very much of an opportunity to do um, these days. Um, my name is Caitlin Beatty. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I am um, the executive director of a project called Invest in Open Infrastructure. Uh, my former lives actually kind of get a little bit more into uh, how I started on this journey and why licenses are something that I've got a lot of opinions about. Um, I was part of the original Creative Commons team that actually worked on um, applying the sort of Creative Commons ethos and that remix and reuse philosophy to research in the early 2000s. Um, it, it's where some of the gray hairs are kind of coming through. Um, I've also worked on building out some of these programs around open science, um, not only a digital science, uh, in the early days of some of the founding team there, helped start the science program at Mozilla, uh, which the Open Leadership uh, Training Series came out of, and the working, which originally was a working open workshop, um, which I'm always happy to talk about offline because I, I love that program to pieces. And prior to joining Invest in Open Infrastructure, um, took a bit of a different turn at Wikimedia Foundation and helped build out a $60 million endowment to help sustain projects in free knowledge um, in perpetuity. Um, and that recently just hit the $100 million mark. So that, that funding will now start going to help sustain projects in the movement and also those core infrastructures. So I've kind of operated in a number of different spaces. Um, I did, you know, Yo had encouraged me to kind of put something about, you know, my sort of personal, personal life. I really dislike viral data licenses as part of that time at Creative Commons. Um, to give you a sense, um, when I started there, uh, there were three open access journals, uh, Biomed Central, which no longer exists, um, is now what many have kind of, kind of come together into Springer Nature, um, Public Library of Science, and Hendali, which also recently merged with Wiley. Um, but also at that time thinking about access to content, um, we were at the very, very early stages of talking about data and materials and code um, being the early 2000s. And so um, I can say that there is a testament to viral share alike data licenses in my husband's wedding vows that are in an openly licensed repository online if you really want to do some digging. Um, but that's not why you're here. So let's get on with the show. Um, so talking about the licensing side of things, um, you know, we focus on this because open leaders at its core is really about empowering others. Um, and these sorts of licenses um, and also thinking about the norms associated with them help you know provide certainty for others about how they can reuse and how they can build off of their work which is a fundamental tenet um, of this program and this training series um, it falls into you know this sort of build for and sharing part of the open leadership framework about common space peer production and this belief of you know enabling others through documentation licensing 
um, stewardship and all of the other core tenants that you'll be exploring over not only the past four weeks, but the additional 12 weeks, is that right? The first 16 week program. Some common misconceptions about licensing um, is that sharing something on the internet or even on GitHub uh, automatically makes it available for others. Um, that is not the case. It actually becomes very complicated um, depending on where you are in the world, what sort of object it is, whether it is content, what may fall under copyright, whether it's software or code, uh, whether it's data, whether it's a physical material that may have a digital presence. Um, there's a lot of nuance when you start to get into this. Also, another common misconception is that sharing your work with a license um, does not give away your copyright. You still retain that, um, you can still publish, sell that, et cetera. Um, there are various uh, means of building in some of these other permissions. So if you think of you know, some of the Creative Commons licensing suite, which many here might be familiar with, that really was taking a pretty restrictive copyright regimen of all rights reserved, you might see that language around, and taking that and making it more permissive, putting the ownership in the hands of the creator, being you all, and saying, you know, we want to give the opportunity for others to reuse this in ways that we're going to specify. And there's a, a, a number of different types of licenses and various forms even beyond the Creative Commons suite that allow you to do so. And then also um, using work shared with an open license without attribution can be legal, but it's still not something we uh, really promote. Um, it's still a violation of academic ethics. Um, you know, cite, citing and providing you know, credit to those who are kind of creating those materials that you're utilizing is best practice. Um, in some cases, there are means where you know, if something's in the public domain, then you don't necessarily need to have that. But that's this is also something that, um, in many cases, it's codified in the legal text. So, like the base Creative Commons license, a CC BY license, you might see it listed as, is a the Creative Commons attribution license where you can use it for commercial purposes, you can use it for um, reuse, you can build off of that create derivative or other sorts of works, but you do need to attribute the core um, person who created them. Um, the sort of citation element is a norm and a best practice. So in some cases where that is not maybe codified in um, legal text, it is still something we would recommend doing um, to the extent that you can. Truly open licenses, common elements here. Um, in many cases, there are a number of key elements to look for about how someone can use the license and using it for any purpose, how they can modify the work or create derivative works is, is often the language we'll see associated with that. And then um, how they can redistribute or share that uh, with anyone else with the same license. Um, in this GitHub glossary quote of open source software, software can be freely used and modified and shared both modified and unmodified. And we'll make these um, slides available in the other paths to go through and see some of these things. Attribution, most open licenses uh, require others to credit, um, credit the authors or the copyright holders of the work. In some cases, um, you know, the copyright holders might be an organization, it might be a project. Um, you can specify in some cases uh, how you want to be cited if you're creating a license for or applying the Creative Commons license to your work. The um, most common example, again, is a CC BY license. Um, and almost all other licenses that will today have this as sort of a founding tenant. Um, the exception is CC0, which is actually um, a project from my early days of Creative Commons. Um, CC0 is uh, a public domain waiver. And so it's essentially saying that, you know, we are making this available for folks to use in however they choose. You can use it for commercial purposes, you can redistribute, you can build off of it, and you do not need to cite an author because we're, we're waiving that right. Um, and so CC0 originally came out of work to talk about how we can put data into the public domain, how we can um, make things even more freely available and waiving attribution. 
copy left and derivative work. So copy left licenses, especially when you're talking about software and code, um, this is where, um, and also things like, for example, Wikipedia um, is under a viral share alike license. Um, this idea that the license requires you can reuse it in ways that are specified by that license, but you need to make it available under at least that license, if not a more restrictive license. So you need to share and share alike. Um, this sort of uh, reciprocal, it, it, you know, also known as a viral license, um, requires that all of those derivative works be um, shared under the same license. Um, in I would say the 1980s, taking back to the 1980s, this sort of came, came up in talking about free and open source software in terms of how we can make sure that items stay in you know, the commons. This has been sort of um, evolved, like there's been different forms of thinking in terms of the open access movement, which advocates for an even more permissive license and talking about just requiring attribution. Um, and so when we think of non-copy left licenses, we're thinking of permissive non-reciprocal licenses. So things that do not require you to put it under the same license or something that's more restrictive. Um, and so examples of that, not only the Creative Commons Attribution License, but if we're talking about software, um, the MIT License, the BSD License, which is Berkeley Software Distribution, and the APL um, 2.0 License, Paul and we'll provide some links so you can explore the details for this um, a little bit later as well. But just something to keep an eye out, of, uh, eye out for, especially if you're looking to utilize um, other resources or other software. Um, to keep an eye out for what sort of license your work, if you're combining it, might be. Um, and for example, if you were to pull in some content from Wikipedia and you wanted to make your work ultimately available under an attribution license based on the license for that work, if it was under a share alike provision, the base license for that work would be a share alike provision or something more restrictive. Um, patents do not copyright. Copyright <laughs> rights include copy, modifying, and redistributing. Patent rights including the right to use, make, and sell. Um, open source software licenses may or may not contain a clause explicitly granting patent rights. Um, if you plan to patent your software or defend your patent, please talk to a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. Um, I don't play one on TV. Um, and also, you know, I would say uh, keep an eye out for you know, patents as um, something that can often limit additional reuse and innovation. I know that there are certain fields within, uh, you know, research and life sciences that are very patent heavy, um, especially when it comes to commercializing technology, but, um, you know, evaluate and have some conversations with others about whether or not that is something that helps add to your project. Um, how to apply a license, you can place the full text of the license in a text file, um, usually named license um, in the root directory. And I know Emma was talking about some of the core elements to include in your repository. Um, you can include multiple licenses. So, you know, one for content, one for software, as long as you're explicit about which applies to which. Um, we normally kind of specify this in the readme so that it's easier for individuals to know what permissions might exist and what licenses um, apply to the content that you have there. And um, sorry, I'm not looking at the chat. I think I saw. Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of, uh, like we mentioned before, data does not equal code, which does not equal creative work. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, when we talk about copyright, and also depending on where you are in the world, so, you know, just for a brief example, um, you know, if I were to write a blog post here in the US. Um, technically for copyright, as soon as I take my pen off paper or fingers off keyboard, copyright applies. And so that's you know something to kind of keep in mind. Whereas Yo, who's based in the UK, um, if she were to do the same, you know, there are also different jurisdictions and different rules that apply, especially in Commonwealth countries. Hop over to Europe, different rules apply, especially when it comes to data. Um, and so, you know, thinking through where you can make some of this clearer by having open licenses applied um, and also specifying that into the readme can help global collaboration as well. But also um, there's some links that are provided that provide some additional 
um, input about you know what can apply in certain areas, um, especially when you're, you're talking about code versus um, creative content. And so just something to keep in mind that you know there are a lot of resources out there that can help you navigate that because um, it can get complicated quickly. Uh, GitHub can add a license for you, part one. Uh, you can um, apply a license list in the drop down list here, um, and that can help. We can kind of talk through a little bit about that after this. Um, and when adding a new file named license, you can choose a license template. And thanks to the Open Leadership uh, Group for this, um, uh, Open Life Sciences Group for this lovely little visual appearance well that shows you how that happens. As I mentioned before, um, for software, for content, and for data, there are some recommendations, especially when it comes to open science, um, that are helpful in keeping in mind, um, especially when you're talking about software licenses, when you're talking about content licenses, and then also uh, for data, which in many parts of the world, copyright does not apply, um, especially in the US. Um, if it is you know, kind of facts or kind of base data, and there's no sort of creative expression, copyright does not apply to do that. And so that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons we advocate for using um, CC0 and, and waiving copyright to make it as open as possible. Additional links here that can help you uh, in, in navigating this and you can learn a little bit more about um, how these different organizations are approaching, you know, open source and applying licenses to help advocate and to make you know resources more openly available and reusable and also the license choosers are really helpful uh, the last bit of this year um, you need a license so others can build off your work uh, that top level file should be named license um, please use a different license for code for data and for content and these are the recommendations here um, i'm also a big fan of the mit license Creative Commons Attribution License is what is um, recommended for open access compliance. Um, and for data, we recommend exploring using CC0. That's it. Um, the Open Life Science Program helps early stage researchers and potential academic leaders become ambassadors. And um, I'm always happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was really fantastic. <laughs> And very quickly done because it's so complex as well. <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. So, thank you. And um, I could see. Um, so, if anyone wants to put any more questions uh, or has any questions, they can put their hand up or put it in the chat. I see there's a couple of uh, interesting questions um, actually in the Etherpad, which I'm just going to shout out now. Um, so you talked about not liking viral licenses, but someone's asked um, if, there, if there is a valid use for them, in your opinion. Oh, this I think becomes a bit more of like a, um, a personal <laughs> a personal preference. Um, in some cases, you know, the, the viral licenses really came out of this aim, um, and especially in the early open source days, when open source was being heavily utilized in commercial environments. And so it was a means of maintaining like the five software freedoms. And this was, you know, I used to work across the hall from Richard Stallman, um, who's known for the Free Software Foundation. And, and yeah, I saw Yo's eyes just kind of get big. It was a telling experience. Um, but, you know, keeping in mind that aim, um, or at least that sort of origin story of when, you know, big commercial companies were starting to employ open source software in the late 80s and early 90s about how to ensure that resources maintained their openness. Um, it is something that I know is commonly used and uh, is the license default in Wikipedia. And so uh, worth noting that Wikipedia has been wildly successful uh, and that has allowed for that sort of global knowledge base to evolve. So that probably would be my main example. Um, one of the main reasons that I uh, don't like viral share like licenses, or at least I would caution using viral share like licenses is that it can limit downstream effects. Um, it can be restrictive when you start to think about, for example, if you were to have a viral share like license that also had a non commercial provision on it so that no one could use it for commercial purposes, then every single thing that's done with that work has to follow that or become more restrictive and a more restrictive version 
for that is to say that no derivative works can be created for it. So you're essentially saying that it can only be used in those sorts of ways, which might prohibit people from using your work. Um, it has these unintended consequences, not necessarily because the aim of what you're trying to protect is, you know, in any way wrong or maybe not suited to the aims, but because of the complexity of this, um, if you know, we have found with some of the work from Creative Commons that if individuals think that it might be more complicated than they thought to use a work or incorporate it, or there might be some risk. In some cases, they just move on to using a different resource. And so if you're looking for that resource to be used, that's where it might be um, useful to think about making it more permissive, maybe even including as like a norm or like in your readme to say, you know, we really would like for you not to use this for these sorts of purposes. Because, you know, enforcement of these licenses, you can either do that through a legal mechanism or, again, through a best practice um, that you might include in the documentation there as well. But that's helpful. Thank you. Do we, do we, have, you know, do we have time for another question or do we need to move on? We always get a lot. So let's say one more. Um, mm -hmm. and hopefully we won't squeeze the other questions, other, other talks too I'll much. try to answer them in the pad too as well. Definitely. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I thought the, the other interesting question I thought was, because we um, said, uh, provided that science outputs are by definition collaborative efforts, um, at least within the same academic group, who in the group should decide the license? That's quite an interesting question, Ooh. I thought. <laughs> that is a really interesting question. And I would say that that has shifted a little bit recently because it used to be you know the main kind of principal investigator or the person sort of the top um but we actually have seen especially for the last 15 years it's been a long time um that individuals uh who've been advocating for these licenses as well as the changes for um submission and funder requirements um in terms of talking more about and as we've seen over the last 18 months of the pandemic talking more about access to knowledge about requirements for making information freely available. In some cases, that's a contingent upon funding. In some cases, in some cases, that's contingent about where you might want to publish or share your work or best practices for those communities. So I would say um, advocate for, you know, advocate strongly. There's a lot of resources there that can help you make that case. Um, and hopefully that can be more of a discussion than a top down. Thanks. That's wonderful. So I think um, I think we do need to move on. So thanks, Caitlin, so much. I'll try to answer some of these while you move on. Thank you. Questions. Wonderful. You're welcome. So um, so we're going to move on to um, the world of readmes, um, which is something I love. I have to say, I get readme crazy in my repositories at the moment. Um, so Alex, over to you. Okay. Can everyone see some slides? Yes, and I can hear you well. Wonderful. Hopefully they're the right slides, or this is going to be a very fun turn, or this could be a fun presentation. So hi everyone, my name is Alex, uh, my pronouns are they and she. It's really nice to be back at, at speaking at OLS, I think this is my third time, but different topic this time. And so I'm going to be talking to you about how to write, about writing readme, the importance of writing a readme for your project, and what the readme is meant to achieve. So for my day job, I work for an organization called Welcome Collection. Welcome Collection is a museum and library exploring the intersection of health and human experience. And for those who don't, you, those of you who don't know, museums and libraries are buildings full of books and artifacts that we would visit to learn things in the before times. But we are actually starting to open back up now and start having people coming through the doors, which is really exciting. Uh, I should have said as well, I will make all the slides, pictures, links and so on, that will be available after the talk. So I work at Wealth and Collection, I work in our digital services, things like our website, our catalogue, our digital preservation, and a big part of my job is actually explaining what we do to other people. We have, we're quite lucky in terms of the amount of funding we get, we do a lot of cool stuff, but all the cool work we do is not, is very difficult to share if no, if no one can understand what we're doing. Projects sort of, you know, they start like this, they have just a huge number of files, a huge number of pieces. Um, and it can often be quite difficult when you'll start looking at a new project to know where to start, right? What should I read first? What particular piece of file, what file would be interesting? What, where's the code start? How do I follow it through? And so when you're dealing with a new project, when someone's coming to a project for the first time, you really want to make sure they have an easy guide. They know where to start. They know what to look at first. 
And so the mechanism for sort of helping people navigate the new project is the README file. Now the README file has been around a while. Um, this is a screenshot of a README right on Macintosh system 7.0.1, which was released in 1991. So it's probably older than several of the people on this call, um, but actually readmes go back even further than that. The earliest example I could find was a 1974. So it's a really old concept. And the idea of the readme is that it would be the first thing you read when you come to a new project. So in this case, I've got, you know, you've got your brand new computer, there's gonna be a readme file and you would open that file and it has some text, some explanation of how to use this new, this, this shiny new computer. But the same concept applies to our projects, that the readme file would be the first file that somebody can read to get a sense of what our project's about, why it's interesting, why they might want to use it. Now today, um, because computers are more advanced, we can no longer handle spaces in file names. Um, so the convention tends to be, um, tends to be to do readme in all capital letters. And you might also sometimes see that with the .txt or the .md extension to indicate the file format. As this is a file at the root of your project, so the top level of your project of your repository, and this is intended to be the first file that somebody would read to tell them about your project. One of the previous speakers for OLS who talked about readme sort of likened it to the idea of welcome map. I really like that idea. It's sort of, you know, it's making a slightly more a gentle introduction for somebody to your project. So it's about giving them sort of that initial introduction, showing them where everything is, rather than just throwing them into a whole a large collection of files and leaving them to fend for themselves. So readme is sort of a welcome map for your project. When I think about readme, there are sort of three questions that I um, that I really want to answer, that I really want to read me to answer. So first of all, what is the project? You've done all this cool work, um, you put it in a repository, you've shared it with somebody, but what does the project actually do? That's the question someone's, so that's the first question to answer. What problem is it trying to solve? Why is it interesting? Why would somebody want to use it? It's really important to state that up front because it's much easier to get that from a few lines of prose than it is by reading hundreds of lines of code. The next thing is who should use it? Who is it interesting to? Who might find this project useful? Um, and equally sometimes, who shouldn't use it? Who's it not for? Uh, often projects are focused, you wanna be quite tightly focused in what you're doing. Um, so, it's really good, so it's really good to explain exactly who you think is aimed at. And finally, how do they get started? So things like, how do they install it? How do they get the code? How do they try it? How do they know it's working correctly? So this is sort of three questions that I try to answer when I'm writing a readme because that's what somebody needs to get started with a project to really get up and running and start using it. And because this is such an important file, if you share your code on popular platforms like GitHub or GitLab, I've got two screenshots here, you'll see the readme is given fairly high prominence in the display of the pro on the project page. So this is the front page of two projects I just picked at random, and you can see a large amount of the space is given over to the readme.md file, introducing new users to the project. So if you've landed on this page for the first time, that's the first thing you'd see. It's a, really, it's a really important file, again, to introduce users to the project. So what is the project? Who should use it? How do they get started? There are also different templates you can look at, checklists, um, and I think there will be some links in the etherpad. Uh, they're not in this presentation, um, but I often find actually the best way to sort of find, to sort of learn how to do a good readme is actually to look at examples. So you will use projects or projects you use, go and look at their readmes. What did you find useful? What did you wish they'd included? How easy did you find it to get started on that project? So I'm gonna look at a few examples now. As I picked a package at random, this is an R package called read Excel. Now for context, I have not written any R in about a decade. So I am very out of touch with this world. I don't know anything that's going on, but I picked this project and let's see if I can, if we, you know, what the readme can tell us. So the very first line of the read, so first of all, we've got a few of these build badges here. These sort of often giving us useful information or statistics, so it's version 1.3.1. Uh, but the interesting bit is really the prose. In the first sentence, the read Excel package makes it easy to get data out of Excel and into R. And that's a really clear statement, right? Instantly, I know exactly what the project is about, who it's for. I'm not an R programmer, so this project is not for me. If I was an R programmer, but I had PDF documents, also not for me. But if you know that you work with R and Excel, really obvious up front that that's what this project's about, that's who it's for. It then explains a little more detail about, you know, oh, it's got no Excel dependencies, it's really easy to install. So again, it's sort of useful information trying to sell us on the project, and it gives a few more details. 
So once we sort of, you know, by the time you finish these six lines of text, you have a pretty good idea of what the project does and whether it's something that might solve your problem. So you're either hooked, this is interesting, or you know it's not for you and you've gone elsewhere, you've been able to save time. And this is substantially easier than it would be if we had to read large amounts of code. We scroll down the page and there are some instructions about installation. So again, it's sort of telling us this is, these are a couple of the ways we might be able to install this package. It does assume a certain amount of familiarity with R. So it assumes you know where you're gonna run this install command. Um, a readme does not have to reinvent the entire universe, but um, it's just sort of telling us okay, how we can get started with this package if we think it's something we wanna try. And then you scroll down a little further and it actually has some example code that we can run. And this is always my favorite thing to see in a readme. Example code saying do X and then Y, and then you will see Z. Because I can start to get a sense of whether this, without even installing it, I can just read this and get a sense of what the library is going to do. And once I have installed it, I can actually try it locally and see if it, see if I've installed it correct. This is a really easy way to get started. So that's sort of one of my favorite read me. Um, really clear what it is, really clear about who we should use it, who's the target audience, and how they should get started. I'm going to run through two more examples quickly. Um, this is the NumPy README, so NumPy, another package that some of you might be familiar with. This one treats it a little bit differently. Um, you, we can, you know, they sort of decided front load their README with a bunch of links out to other places. And that can also be really good sometimes sort of providing a bunch of points to different things, particularly if you're a project where people are probably going to know what you're doing up front. Um, but again, it's sort of a nice shot. And there is a little bit here telling us what it is if we weren't familiar. And the final README is curl. Curl is another really popular tool. And again, we've got quite a short explanation at the top. It's a one line description. Curl is a command line tool for transferring data specified with URL syntax. I'd kind of like an example here, a little something to give me a flavor of how the tool works. Um, but it sort of, it does a reasonable job of explaining the project very quickly and giving you some points out to go and get more detailed information. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what I'm reading. It's telling us, it's giving us an introduction to the project, telling us what it's doing, who should use it, and hopefully getting us started towards actually using it. Uh, let's see. So a readme is sort of like the welcome, again, a readme is the welcome map for your project. It's the first thing a user is going to see. We can do all this great work. We can publish it. We can put the code in a public repository. But if somebody doesn't understand what we're doing and they don't understand what problem our project will solve for them, they're unlikely to use it. So readme is that really important first step, getting the user interested, getting somebody engaged, and getting them to realize that the project we've built might be something they want to try. I'm not going to, I've run out of time, but I would just say again, go and if you want to learn how to write a good readme, obviously do look at templates, do look at checklists, plenty available on GitHub, on Google, sorry. But the best way to learn is to look at other readmes, look at other readmes for projects in your field, in your area, what sort of information do they include? What works do you want doesn't and incorporate those into your readme. So that is very briefly a little bit about readme for open projects, why they're important, why you might want to write them, what purpose they serve, and hopefully giving you a little flavor of how they might be written. Slides are not yet up, but they will be up later this evening, including links to every, all the readmes I showed you and a few other things besides. So yeah, those are readmes for open projects. Does anybody have any questions? I was not looking at the chat, so let's have a look. I think there is a question from Nadine. I think it's in the chat. Okay. Can you see the chat? Oh, Alex? yeah. Just yes, I can. Hold on just a sec. Uh, yes, let me move some moves around. Right. Ah, so what if I didn't know what R and Excel are? How much should I take into account possible lacks in knowledge in my description of the project? That's a really good question. Um, and sort of depends on the area on, on the area of, you know on the area you're in um one thing i've often found right is that a readme does not necessarily have to explain something to everyone it's not necessarily meant to be the sort of the comprehensive reference on a topic it's an introduction to a project so in this particular example right if you don't know what r and excel are the readme um what exactly what did it actually say let me find the exact word Right, so it said it, the exact readme was the read Excel package makes it easy to get data out of Excel and into R. So even if you don't know what Excel, are, if you, you know, it's sort of implied this is a tool for connecting these two things. And if you don't know what those two things are, you probably get a sense this project is not something you're going to be interested in. 
um, our project is not solely trying to appeal to all, be all things to all people, and sometimes being really clear, this is not a project that's going to be useful to you, you should go elsewhere, can be a totally valid and useful thing for Readme to do, um, because you're not wasting somebody's time. I think the worst thing you can do is you have a project that has a very specific purpose, but somebody can't work that out until they've invested half an hour into trying to dig through it and look at all the pieces. Um, so I would assume sort of competence in your field, assume expertise, assume that someone is reasonably at least familiar with the high level content. And if they're not, it's probably a sign that maybe this is, this is not the project, that this is not a project you should be looking at. Unless of course the purpose of your project is to be an introduction to the topic. So that was a really long roundabout answer, but I hope that, that answered uh, Nadine's question. Oh, super. Thank you very, thank you very much, Alex. I think we might have to move on now. So over to you, Annie. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Alex. Um, right, talking about um, making it clear, making it understandable for potential contributors of your project. Um, I'm wondering how many of you have had the chance to have a go at putting your vision statement into UpGoa Five. UpGo5 is a text editor. I'll just put a link in the chat right now. Um, so if you haven't had the chance to do it before, don't worry, you can still do it now. Just we've asked you to come up with your vision statement for uh, your project last week, two weeks ago. Um, and uh, so if you just have that at hand and try and head to that website that I've just put on the chat and you can copy that in and see what comes out of it. Um, we'd like you to, in breakout rooms, um, share the vision statement after the modification with UpGore 5 and let us a little know a little bit about what you think about this exercise. So we're going to do this in breakout rooms because they'll, otherwise there'll be quite a lot to read through. But of course, if you put it on the etherpad, then everyone else can read it as well. Um, yo, are we... Uh, we're going to have seven minutes, sorry, and three people per room. Should have explained that. Um, are we good? Okay. Then head into your breakout room, put your vision statement into Upgore 5, and just discuss what you think about it. Have fun. Rooms are open. Hey, Manuel, just checking, did you manage, have you had the prompt come up? Uh, no worries, if there's anything you need, uh, I don't, we, we can't actually hear you, um, but also please let us know in chat if there's anything you need. Hey, Lizanna, are you having connection issues? Yes, I am. Do you want us to try and put you back in a room or are you going to um, chill? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even figure out exactly what you said. So <laughs> I'm trying to stabilize my connection before trying to communicate with anyone. No worries. If you're here. <laughs> Thanks, um, Caitlin and Alex. Those were some incredible talks, both. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Always, a, always a pleasure. Yeah, I hope that wasn't too myself. much. <laughs> I, I always think licenses is like the worst talk to give because it's so complicated, <laughs> and also nobody. Else else understands it I, don't, I find it's the thing that people really want to understand but they find very difficult to understand so I think you did it yeah. brilliantly yeah. thank you yeah the enforcement also stuff is always sticky so always a topic on which people always have very strong opinions 
I'm terrified talking about licenses because somebody in the audience is, is I'm worried somebody in the audience will come up to me afterwards and explain to me why, I don't know, viral licenses are actually the best thing since sliced bread and how could you consider not using them and this makes me a terrible, terrible person or something. I have five years of that lived experience being across the hall from Richard Stallman. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I'm just going to just make it bigger, hopefully. Might take me a little while just to change it. There we go. You see it nicely now, everybody. Okay, so thanks, yeah. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, contributing guidelines and codes of conduct for open projects. Um, so I'm going to cover um, how we can consider um, creating a positive culture for contribution and collaboration on open projects, and then um, give some practical examples. I'm going to show you some examples of different contributing guidelines and um, codes of conduct from different projects. Um, so I'm Emma, um, I'm a core contributor to the Turing Way project, um, which Malvika is the community manager of, and I also work as a community manager on the DeCovid project, which is a COVID-19 project, so um, I've been doing that all this year, so it's been quite an intense experience, a diff very different to the Turing Way in terms of a community. Um, so... I think the important thing um, to bear in mind is that you as a project leader are trying to build a community around your project and you're trying to attract volunteers to your project and these uh, will have diverse backgrounds and come with different expectations and experiences so um, you as the project leader you have to initiate um, the culture of the project um, and if you don't do this a culture will actually develop on its own and this means that um, you need to make some conscious choices regarding how you want your community to be. So what values should your community advocate for and how do you want people to behave with each other um, in your project? So um, things to remember here is that um, the project is more than goals. Um, it's actually to get a collaboration working can be quite complex, actually. Um, it's about the languages you use, um, a shared set of norms, people's expectations, even the tools and communication streams that you use are things you need to consider and plan for. Um, and all of these things affect the health of the community um, around the project and so the, the project itself. Um, so how do you go about shaping this culture for your project? So um, we can use these two things, uh, a very clear collaboration um, contribution guidelines and um, a code of conduct that is going to be enforced. And that's actually a very important thing. Um, so, um, so what do we really think of when we think of a community? So when you're thinking of your community, you need to think about identifying the different types of people that um, might be part of your community and defining those groups of people. Um, and then you have to think about what their motivation is going to be to be part of your community. So we're building this community around our project um, that's going to help us to distribute some of the leadership, hopefully, um, beyond you as an individual because um, it's always good to obviously have help on your project. You might be a small team, so you might want to expand that. And it's also great to um, uh, uh, have more people and develop the project so that you are, um, uh, your project has a, has a longer survival sort of period. So you're building for the future, really. So what is um, contribution about? Um, so what we're trying to do is to get people to actually contribute to your project. Um, in this context, it's important to remember that your contributions are actually people um, and they have their own worldviews and their own histories um, that they come with. Um, we need to take this into consideration when we're trying to build a welcoming atmosphere so that people will want to contribute to your project. So this is where our um, contribution guide comes in. And you can see one here that is being um, named contributing.md for markdown file um, within a GitHub repository. So what does this, why do we need this? And who is it gonna be for? And what sorts of things can we get in it or put in it? So the kinds of information um, that we want to put in this document or documents, because it can be several documents, 
um, our things um, for the different types of people that are going to contribute um, to the project and are going to use the project. So really we're thinking about all of the different people in the community. So it could be your potential contributors. So um, you want to explain about the process and the different conventions that they'll need to follow in making contributions. So um, when I was thinking about this, this might be instructions of how to collaborate in GitHub using issues and pull requests, or it might be something about the style of um, how you do documentation in your project. Um, and then also, um, um, you also need to think about um, the way that you expect people to interact um, in your community. So this might be about highlighting different forms of communication or information about how to attend community events or co-working. Um, so you also need to think about project consumers. So those who are actually going to build off your project. So you might, um, uh, in your contributing guidelines, you might give some instructions about remixing and reusing um, your project and you might um, tell them how best to do this and, and what they're actually allowed to do. So it kind of links in a way to the license there, you can put some links in. Um, let me just go on to the next one. So I put in some examples here. So if you want to have a look at the Turing Way contributing file, um, we've got just these things in there. Um, it's actually a very long list, but we've got things about joining the community, um, the inclusivity bit is about our code of conduct, um, how we get in touch or how people get in touch with us. So that's about our different communication channels. And then it goes on to quite a lot of detailed information about how you actually contribute. And we mostly contribute through GitHub. So it, there's a lot of information about that explains how you actually do that. So you might not need to go into that much information, but it's a good one to look at to actually um, see a very detailed contributing um, guidelines. Um, and then another one here, which is from the Carpentries um, community, and um, this is a web page. So they've made their, um, this again is a very thorough a contributing guideline. So it's developed for different types of people that are coming into their projects. So they've got um, people who are trainers, they've got different champions, and uh, you can also see their code of conduct is also linked there. So that's a specific web page as a, um, to tell contributors what they uh, can do within the project. So um, moving on now to um, uh, codes of conduct, um, uh, the basis for this is that um, to have this well, uh, this well functioning community, you need to take into consideration that other people in the project are not carbon copies of ourselves. Um, if you're lucky, um, you're able to build a diverse community for your project, uh, which has a diversity of people and a diversity of opinions, um, which will make your project, um, you know, really strong and help them um, to be original and adapt to um, different contexts. Um, but um, what happens if you have an issue within your community? What do you actually do? So this is where a code of conduct comes into play. And so a code of conduct um, is um, explains what is accepted and what is not. And then it also tells people what to do if something happens. So that's kind of the basis of it. So um, do we really need a code of conduct? I mean, the simple answer to that is definitely yes. Um, what it does is it invites people to your project. Um, it sets out some clear expectations of your community members when they're interacting uh, in the different ways they can. So that means online in calls like this, but also um, offline as well. So through different communication channels. And it tells contributors that you care about the project because if you're going to enforce um, this, um, sorry about that. If you're going to enforce this um, code of conduct, it really means that you care about the people that are joining your community. So um, here are just some examples. So you, the, the slides are shared on the Etherpad, so you can actually um, go to these examples and have a look. Um, I mean, when I made my code of conduct um, in ONS, I definitely looked at somebody else's and I just adapted it for my own use, which is what I would suggest you should do is just look at some other ones. Um, so here are some examples. Um, it's a, if you have a look at it, um, at the top, it welcomes people to the project. Then it goes on to tell people what you expect of them um, to follow this code of conduct and then the consequences. Um, and it also gives some helpful examples of what they um, determine to be unwelcome behaviour, which I think is something that is important to set out. 
And then um, there are very clear guidelines for how to process incidents um, if something happens. Um, we do do something um, in OLS if you make a complaint. Um, Yo, at the beginning, she said um, that where how to um, uh, give information about um, so if you want to complain about something, if something happens. Um, so it's really important that the, the code of conduct is actually enforced. Otherwise, to be honest, it's not really worth, um, I was going to say the writing, it's the paper it's written on, but it's not really written on paper. It's written on the internet, isn't it? But um, it's not worth writing if you're not going to enforce it, really. Um, so um, just getting to the end, um, how can we start making these codes of conduct? So, uh, I mean, my main tip is have a look at lots of other ones um, so that you can just reuse them. Um, but we can also um, brainstorm about some ideas that represent your community values, consider behaviours to encourage and discourage, and think through the processes that you would go through if something happened, um, like your complaints, who would you, you would complain to and what you would do about that. Um, and what consequences would there be for acting outside the norms um, and really understanding and accepting your role as the project lead that you actually do have to deal with these situations is part of your role. Um, so some takeaways is really to encourage and reward this, this practice um, to designate a code of conduct and safety committee. You might not have enough people for a committee, but you can put yourself as the person to contact. Um, and make sure that your code of conduct is, is visible. So usually on your um, GitHub repository, it's, it's there front and centre. You can link to it from your readme file is a good thing to do. And also communicate this process to contributors. Again, Yo, she said it at the beginning of the call about the code of conduct. And that's what we should be doing when we talk to different um, parts of our, commun our communities when we build those up. Um, and again, use existing codes of conduct because there's lots of really great ones out there. And you might as well not start from scratch. Um, and I think that's all I've got to say. Um, so if you have any questions, please go for it. Thank you very much, Emma. That was very um, clear and very well recent. It was very quick. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but I hope everyone has um, some idea of what a code of conduct is. And um, this is a complex topic. Um, so if you do have further questions or you'd rather, you know, ask uh, to a smaller group, then uh, I think you and I can also stay behind a little bit, just address those. But we do have a question already on the Etherpad and please feel free to put more. Um, how does one enforce a code of conduct when that may feel unpleasant to do? Yeah, it can be unpleasant. I think I've had a few conversations recently, recently with an association um, that I'm a, a board member of and they this was exactly the conversation we had was how how are you meant to enforce that I mean I think you have to have different levels of enforcement and it really depends what people do it depends if it's an in-person thing or if it's something on the internet I, I kind of feel like if it's something unpleasant that happens in an environment like we're in at the moment it in a sense it's fairly easy to deal with that because that person could be taken out of the room really you can take them out quite easily but if it's an in-person event if you're in a comp you know in an in-person conference that's quite different difficult um but i think the thing is you do have to address it i think at the end of the day um because otherwise you're not creating that very positive um, culture in your community thank you emma um all right uh again if you uh, when there, there are more questions, so please do uh, put them on the Etherpad or just stay behind and we can have a chat. Um, but uh, and on the Etherpad, we'll try and address them on the Etherpad as well. And of course, if you have any questions afterwards, um, you can always ask on Slack. I will hand over to you for the closing. Super, I'll be as fast as I can because we are on the minute of the hour when we're supposed to finish. So folks today, in the Etherpad, hop over to line 298. We have some information about the assignments that we have. Um, essentially, we'll ask you to create a GitHub repository for your project um, and start creating some of the files that we've been talking about to welcome people and to create contributors, um, guidelines, et cetera. 
Um, if you've never used GitHub before and you're thinking, oh my God, what does that mean? What do I have to do now? Don't worry. Next week, we have a GitHub skill up call. So you can come along and we will walk you through this process um, together. Um, this is something I don't know if it goes on YouTube, but we, we, we will do our best to make sure that you um, get a repo by the end of this. Uh, so there are a few short links of assignments, but basically it's just making the files we've been talking about, license, readme, code of conduct and contributing guidelines. Uh, next week, you also have the mentor mentee call. Uh, and you don't have to come to the GitHub call if you don't want. It's basically up to you whether you think it's useful or not. Um, and we do have recordings, um, or we can also help you out with specific things if you can't make the call next week. Um, as always, we have a feedback section at the very end of the document, um, just asking what worked with this call, what didn't work, um, what would you change or what surprised you. Um, but with that, I think I'm going to stop recording. And if anyone wants to ask any final questions and linger after the closing, then you're very welcome to do.